Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Black History Month 2020 and this uh, discussion um, about the uh, Jesus College alumnus um, and the founder of the African National Congress, Pixley Kaisaka Seme. Now, Pixley may not be known to many of our viewers, um, yet his political activism really led to the transformation of South Africa in the 20th century. And I'm delighted to welcome today, to be able to talk about Pixley's life, Dr. Bungani Unkulunga, Director of the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Bungani is an academic, he's a public sector administrator and author, and he worked for the South African presidency for a decade prior to joining the university. And last year published a book called The Man Who Founded the ANC, a biography of Pixley Kursaka Seme. Good morning, Bungani. Well, well, good morning. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Jesus College, which is where Pixley went to, has taken an interest in his life. I mean, he was an extraordinary man, as we'll discuss now. He was an extraordinary man. Now, Pixley um, was born in the colony of Natal in 1881. And as we will find out later, he went on to study law at Jesus College in the early 1900s. Um, and he led an incredible life. But he comes from very humble beginnings in Natal, doesn't he? Yes, I mean, he, he does. I mean, he, he came from an area called Inanda, which is about 12 kilometers from the port city of Deben, uh, well, in the then colony of, of, of Natal. He was the youngest uh, son, I mean, of a family of about 10 kids, um, but quite a smart young man, which really ultimately led him to Oxford. Um, but he was identified by an American missionary uh, Stephen Pixley, and that is where he got his first name from, uh, Pixley Guy Salasem. I mean, he was just known as Isaac, but when he got to the United States, where he went for high school and university, he changed his last, his first name to Pixley, in, in appreciation, I suppose, uh, to Reverend Stephen Pixley, who had gotten him to study in the United States, which ultimately led him to Oxford University. And what do you think that um, the Reverend Pixley saw um, uh, in the young Pixley uh, when he went to the mission? I, he was just an, an extraordinarily intelligent young man. And of course, it was not unusual for young black converts. I mean, because these were Christian converts. I mean, this is one of the significant things that you, has to be known about Pixley. And that is the reason why in his youth, he did not even use his last name, his surname, Seme. He adopted that later on. I mean, because what Christian converts used to do at the beginning was to assume or take the surnames of the missionaries. I mean, basically we were looking after them and we were converted them. So in the case of, of Pixley, he was the first generation in a sense of black Africans who had access to formal education. And so, I mean, as I've said, a very intelligent young man. I mean, to think that Reverend Stephen Pixley took him, I think he was only 14 years old, when he took him to study in high school in Massachusetts. That just tells you the, the level of his confidence in Pixley's uh, abilities. So, you, yes, yes exactly. you say, he, went, he, he traveled to America when he was 14 years old. And, and how is that time... Um, recorded? Did he keep a diary or is it all through the notes of the, um, the universities? How, how were you able to find out for your book um, research um, that sort of period of his life when he first started there? I mean, what was interesting, I mean, most of this, when he was applying to go to boarding school in Western Massachusetts, I mean, of course, I mean, he had to fill an application form that gave quite a detailed background, I mean, about his, uh, his life. I mean, one of the most difficult things that I had to deal with uh, writing, researching and writing the biograph of Pixley is that he didn't leave any papers behind. Mm. I mean, it was like I was teaching, I mean, from collecting different fragments and trying to stitch them together, I mean, to create this portrait of Pixley Guy Sagasem. I mean, just one thing, I mean, about the decision by Reverend Pixley to take him to the United States. Remember, they were also trying to educate a generation of black missionaries. I mean, at first, really, it was not just taking him there, I mean, to study for the sake of study. The ultimate goal was to make him to be a missionary so that he could convert 
uh, other black people. I mean, of course, uh, things turned out quite differently for Pixlgai Sagasen, yes. Yes, it certainly did. So he um, uh, went to Columbia University yes. um, and, uh, and then came on to Jesus College. Um, but I yeah. know it's around this time he started to sort of form ideas about the political yeah. system back in South Africa. Um, yeah. Firstly, do you think his experience in America actually um, started to influence those sort of thoughts that he was having? I mean, it was a transformational period in Pixley's life. I mean, remember that this is a young man who had never left the colony of Natan, and I suspect had never left the port city of Durban. And he travels 10,000 miles to the United States. I mean, studying firstly in New York City, and from New York City, he goes to Massachusetts. In, this is 1898. And so he spends about four years in high school in the United States. In 1902, he goes to Columbia University. I mean, this is an exciting time in the United States, but also in the African diaspora generally. I mean, there are debates, especially among African Americans, about their condition in the United States and whether they should go back to the African continent. And there are some African Americans who are going back to the African continent in places like Liberia, and Sierra Leone. So, I mean, that context is quite important to understand what Pixley became. And so he gets very politicized in the United States. I mean, it is the point where, in a sense, he changes his name again and starts assuming what you could call an African and even an pan-African identity. Starts calling himself Pixley Isagaseme, basically the son of Isaga, who was his, his father. But I mean, it is a very interesting way, I mean, of expressing your identity. And it has a history because Zulu men at the time, I mean, how they used to be known. And so if uh, I was, my name is Bongani, I would be named Bongani off and, and mention my father's name. And so in a sense, he's in New York City and he writes about the influence of New York City in his life. I mean, he says, it is really the center of the world. And without New York, you wouldn't be the man that he became. But at the same time, it's like he is going back to his roots. I mean, by the manner in which he starts identifying him, himself. And of course, all of that culminates in that famous speech that he made in April 1906, the regeneration of Africa. Yes, so tell us a little bit about that speech because he's still, he's still a young man. Um, but the, you know, the words in that speech could be written by an elder statesman. You know, he had a real kind of um, insight. I don't know what I don't know what the right word really is to to use about um, the that kind of that ownership and understanding of his nation and how um, how he saw the um, there being an opportunity to to change things for the better. I mean, it was partly a reflection of his own abilities, intellectual abilities, as we have spoken. But it is also his, this, if you read it in its context, is a contribution to this general conversation, especially amongst African Americans in the United States. Because even though some of them are looking back towards the African continent, in a sense, as their ultimate salvation, but they are quite critical of the African continent. Those who had gone to the African continent, they find in many respects a pretty difficult place to live in. And they start writing about this, um, how backward the African continent is, how uncivilized it is. And so Pixley's uh, speech in 1906 is partly a response to that conversation among African-American intellectuals about the African continent. And what he paints is a complete opposite, I mean, to the general perceptions about the African continent. I mean, he says it has made huge contributions to human civilization. And he paints this floral picture about the past and present of the African continent in a manner that nobody had done before. 
And what was the impact of this speech? First of all, it'd be interesting to know, so how did he, he share this, um, this speech that he the made? Speech, yes. how, was it record, how was it recorded at the time? And what was the impact of it? Well, I mean, interestingly, this is, uh, the speech is a contribution to a student competition, actually, a debating competition. So there's a prize, I mean, the Curtis Medal, in at Columbia. So every year there is a prize and people have to compete and give a speech. And so Pixley, who from the beginning when he arrived in Columbia in 1902 had joined the debating society, is becoming known as a debater, as somebody who gives electric speeches. But really nobody expected him to give the speech that he gave. And the people who were judging it were pretty senior academics, I mean, and university officials, including the president of Columbia University at the time. And so after he had given the speech, there was no discussion, I mean, about who had to win. I mean, so he was an outstanding performer and so he was immediately selected as um, the winner of the competition. Now, the significance of the speech, I mean, which is quite interesting. When you read the New York Times, of the following day, Pixley and his speech are reported in the New York Times. Oh. In the San Francisco, um, chronically in the West Coast, and reported in the United Kingdom, in the Guardian. I mean, it was the Manchester Guardian at the time. And of course, I mean, in the newspapers in South Africa, he becomes an instant celebrity um, because nobody had heard this vision of the African continent, especially coming from a young black man who in many respects was a South African, but had, had, been, had been influenced by his American experience. I mean, even the way he spoke, they say he spoke like an American. Mm -hmm. So it been difficult to, I mean, you would have been mistaken to be an African American, I mean, but he identified himself with the African continent and its people and, advocated this vision, in a sense, for their salvation and their contribution to human civilization. So he makes the speech, it, it makes the papers, um, and, and then at some point, I guess, had he at that stage already decided that he wanted to take up a career in law and, um, and, and, he, and think about coming to Oxford? Or how did, um, how, how did he end up at Jesus College? I think the question I'm trying to ask you yeah. after having yeah. such a major impact with that speech. I mean, in a sense, uh, it was surprising and not surprising at the same time. I mean, because, uh, I mean, as I said, the original intention was for him to go to the United States and train to become a missionary. And of course, when he gets to the United States, he changes that. I mean, uh, he goes to, um, to Columbia University, does a BA. Not really, the results are not exceptional. In many respects, he's an indifferent student. I mean, partly because he's just so busy doing so many things. I mean, he's caught up in the life of, of New York. He lives in Harlem. I mean, there is before the Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance in the 1930s, but there's an African American community that is assembling around Harlem. I mean, so he's becoming part of that community. He's in the debating society, he's in the drama society. And so I suspect in some respects, he neglects his studies, but he passes anyway, he gets uh, his, his BA. At first, he thinks he wants to become a medical doctor, um, but he, he changes his mind, partly in response to what is going on in South Africa at the time. Remember, this is after the Anglo-Zulu War, I mean, which happened around 1879, which had a huge influence in black intellectuals like Pix Ligai Sagasem and others who came from South Africa and went to the United Kingdom to, to study law. So, because that, in a sense, I mean, the defeat of black people, I mean, either Zulus in Natal, it forces black people to change strategy. I mean, some of them had engaged in war, I mean, uh, to defend themselves. But in a sense, we have new Africans, like Pixley, Sagasem, who decide, and in fact call themselves new Africans, that actually the road to our salvation is our education. And so we have to go to these best leading centers of education in the world so that we can lead 
the African people, in a sense, to their liberation and to African modernity, because they are quite specific about that. And the person who articulates this vision, I mean, of new African modernity speaks to the Isaga Seme. And that's the reason why he becomes such a celebrity. I mean, sometimes I'm amazed, I mean, at the caliber of people that he was communicating with. People like Booker T. Washington in the United States. And remember, Seme is a kid. I mean, he's in his early 20s. But already recognizing him as one of the leading figures of black people in the world. I mean, in his early, in his early 20s. But I'm saying the political changes in South Africa, in a sense, push him towards law. So I'm saying it was not surprising that he chose Oxford. Uh, I mean, if you know a little bit about Pixley, he thought very highly of himself. I mean, there was no he would not have chosen Oxford uh, University. And, and so he decides to leave uh, the United States. And part of it, why he did not stay in the United States, Pixley and members of his generation appreciated the United Kingdom, in a sense, more than perhaps the generations that succeeded them they considered themselves the subjects of the British Empire. And they were proud of that, that they were, they were British, perhaps if not citizens, but definitely subjects of the British Empire. I mean, even the appeals that they made for political inclusion, the basis of those appeals was that we are subjects of the British Empire and we should be treated equal. So it was not surprising that then Pixley would go to Oxford University to study law because even though he had gone to Columbia, I actually never thought there was a university that was better. And you mm -hmm. see correspondence with his African-American friend, Alan Locke, who was the first African-American to get uh, a full, uh, sorry, to get a Rhodes Scholarship and then came to, to, to Oxford University, yes. And um, he was coming. I'll say, obviously, he 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 came to came to Oxford. And did uh, did he? Uh, oh, when he was writing to his friends about his experience here, um, yeah. did he find it a valuable time? Really, to kind of he obviously had a lot of confidence, but you know, to just really sort of to to ground himself in the um, perhaps in the way of debate and discussion, sort of things that Oxford is brilliant at. Um, you know, yeah. encouraging open thoughts, open ideas, not being afraid to sort of share, share those ideas. Do you think that, yeah, his time in Oxford really sort of helped him to develop as a person? Yeah. No, that is, that is true. I mean, he, he gets to Oxford in October 1906. He joins as a non-collegiate student first. Uh, he only gets admitted to Jesus College the following year, uh, around June 1907. Uh, to study for his BCL, uh, the Bachelor of Civil Laws. <clears throat> he loved Oxford. <laughs> I mean, if you see, I mean, in many ways, Pixley uh, loved the British life. Um, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've seen Oxford and how students dress. And, and Pixley, when you see the photographs, he's dressed. I mean, he has a, a jacket, a tweed, and uh, he has a tie. and. Uh, you know, and he's riding horses at, at, at Oxford. I mean, he sees himself at the very least as an English gentleman, if not even an aristocrat, actually. And <laughs> his appreciation actually for the, the British royal family and, and the British political structure, you see that when he gets back to South Africa, where he tries to implement what he had gone through in the United Kingdom. But he, he's not just only a student there. I mean, he starts living a very interesting life. I mean, you could say a refined life even. I mean, especially for somebody who came from humble beginnings. <clears throat> he, had a, he, he had a piano. Uh, and that got, of course, that got him into huge financial trouble. I mean, because mm -hmm. he lived this extravagant life because he was trying in his view, to fit in in the Oxford way of, of life, I mean, which got him into trouble. But he enjoyed, <clears throat> he enjoyed Oxford. 
spoke about it, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to everybody and, and inviting what he thought were the best minds in the African diaspora, inviting them to come and study at Oxford because he thought there was no better place and, and advising even them which colleges they needed to join. And of course he loved uh, Jesus College and uh, he would recommend to people that they should come to Jesus College, yes. He sounds like a very good ambassador for Oxford and also obviously for Jesus College. And we've actually yeah. just gone through the process. We were, we're constantly sort of, you know, trying to celebrate the value of all the different colleges because they've all got their own different personalities. So we, yes. he'd probably be very helpful to us now, you know, to encourage young students to come and, <laughs> come and, come and, come and join come and us. So that's good yes. to hear. Yes, uh, no, so, he, he loved Oxford, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, so he was at Jesus, um, and I want to now move on to um, uh, to the process of him founding the South African um, Native National Congress, which yes, I think yeah. was in 1912, Mangani, is that right? Yes, that, that was in 1912, yes, in January 1912, yes. Um, yes, yes, go ahead. No, 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 I was just going to say sort of, yeah, tell me, tell me about how that came about. So sort of he finished doing his, um, he finished his degree here in Oxford. And then, yeah, it's just interesting to know kind of the process of whether he was already sort of forming those ideas while he was, well, he obviously had been forming those ideas for a long time. But um, going back, back to South Africa, how then did he get that process started of, of forming this, this, this new Congress? I mean, while, while he's at, at Oxford, he starts commuting at first, I mean, between Oxford and London, uh, because there was another South African who was studying uh, to become a lawyer, Alfred Mangena, also from the colony of Natal, but he, he was in London and, and Pixley struck up a relationship, a friendship with this guy. And so started going to him, visiting him and going to the houses of parliament uh, in, in London. <clears throat> and so you see in the letters that he's writing, uh, he'll be reporting that he was uh, there in the galleries there watching uh, the debates uh, in, in the house. <clears throat> and so increasingly he's spending time in, in, in London rather than at Oxford. And then he, and there's something going on in South Africa. This is moving towards 1909, and there is a discussion in South Africa about the formation of the Union of South Africa, and whether the black people should be included, the political rights should be in, extended to black people. And of course, I mean, in these discussions, black people are excluded. Uh, it's basically the, the colonies, in a sense, the former British colonies of Natal, there is Transvaal, and, and the free state, and they are discussing forming a union, but in these discussions, excluding black people. And so black people start sending delegations to Britain, uh, basically to appeal to the queen. They say, we are your subjects. And there are discussions in South Africa about forming the union of South Africa and we are being excluded. We appeal to you to talk to the colonies, I mean, to the South African government to include us because we are as educated as these people who are determining the future of South Africa are, if not more. I mean, we have people like Pixley Sagasem who has gone to an Ivy League school in, in New York, that has been to Oxford. So it's like, why are we being excluded? I mean, we are as civilized as they are, we are British subjects as they are. And so while those discussions are taking place in South Africa, Black people then sent a delegation in 1909, and that is the turning point for Pixley, because they then meet with Pixley and his friend, Alfred Mangena, who's studying for law, and they get involved in the preparations because this delegation is meeting the senior officials in the British government. And that is when Pixley decides that actually, I need to go back to South Africa, there's something going on. And he comes back to South Africa late in 1910. The Union of South Africa has been formed in May 1910. And one of the first things that Pixley is doing, he says, we've been excluded from the Union of South Africa. We need to establish our own union as black people. He calls it a native union. And so um, around this October 1911, he writes 
he issues a clarion call to all black leaders in South Africa. He says, let us meet before the end of the year, this is 1911, and establish a native union that will represent the interest and aspirations of black people. And of course, the meeting does not take place for logistical reasons. And then he comes up with a date. He says, okay, it is impossible for us to meet in 1911. Let us meet at the beginning of 1912 on January 8, in the middle of South Africa, in the city called Bloemfontein. And that is how what is called the ANC gets formed. And Pixlow, of course, gives the inaugural address and he gets his homeboy and friend to be elected first president of the ANC. John um, and so the Congress is formed. Um, was it effective from day one? Because I imagine even though they've had this sort of quorum, this, this central um, uh, group um, uh, who wanted to get things going, I imagine there were a lot of challenges that faced a new organization like that. Yes, I mean, I mean one of the most surprising things, I mean, is that um, even so, you know, so he's the moving spirit towards the formation of Congress. He does not become his first president. He gets somebody else to become its president who was not even at the conference, but he ensures that that person is elected the first president of the ANC. And, and the reason for that is because Pixley was a man of extraordinary ambition and boundless energy. He has other things going on. He is the first, he's the second black person to be admitted as an attorney in, in South Africa. He starts a company that buys land from white farmers for black settlement. He starts a national newspaper. He becomes the advisor to the Zulu Royal House as well as the Swazi Royal House. He is extraordinarily busy and so to expect him to be busy running Congress to him, I think would have been restrictive. So he entrusts the running of Congress to somebody that he really trusted, John Langanibalele Dube, who was called then him by 10 years, so that he would be busy doing something else. And he becomes a celebrity in South Africa. Because think of South Africa in 1912, there are not a lot of educated black people to start with. We're still a black person who has studied law at Oxford. And so Pixley is going, he opens a legal practice in Johannesburg. I mean, they say, I mean, if you read the newspapers of the time, I mean, there was a day when he was representing a client in central Johannesburg in the magistrate court. They say the city came to a standstill. Everybody rushed to the court to listen to this young man who was impeccably dressed with an American accent, arguing in court that was completely unheard of in South Africa. I mean, so his, his reintroduction or perhaps even introduction into South African public life is a game changer for South Africans that never seen anything like it. Not only is this young man a brilliant lawyer, but he's assuming the mantle of leadership, I mean, establishing the first national organization. And remember that there had been attempts before to start a national political organization for black people and people much senior and older than Pixley had failed. And in a matter of less than two years, Pixley Sagasame had achieved it. It is quite extraordinary. And so he assumes this significance, I mean, as a young man and everybody is talking about Pixley Sagasame. So just, just as an aside, did he um, ever get married or have a family? Oh man, oh man, <laughs> really an, an interesting. So he does get married um, in, in 1915. He gets married to what you could call black royalty at the time. It's a family in the Eastern Cape of South Africa in King Williamstown, uh, a very wealthy family um, with highly cultured, I mean, and that is Pixley for you. So he chooses one of their young daughters, I mean, who played piano. I mean, the family had piano, I mean, at that, at that time, I mean, we told you. And, and so within a year, they divorce. Ah. Within a year, they, they, they divorce. And for a long time, it's not married. 
interestingly, his second wife, the woman that he chooses to be his second wife, is not really a highly educated woman, but she is the first princess, first daughter of a Zulu king. And of course, I mean, that is this British influence, I mean, the British mm. royal So Pitley goes to a woman who's really uneducated, but because she is a royal, I mean, uh, the first daughter of King Dinizulu, he marries that woman, and that is the woman he lives with until he dies in June 1951. Ah, okay. So he 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 found a little bit of time for a personal life, but obviously his, yeah, his career was kind of you know he was he was a very driven man, and so yes. he's so sort of around um the the is it around the nineteen twenties where um he's obviously been leading the congress, um but things start to sort of um, change for the um the SANNC. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that is that is that is true. So Pitley established uh, the SANNC. Um, he's appointed its first treasurer in 1912, but he's really not involved that much in the running of the affairs. And that's the reason why, when it sends its delegation again to the United Kingdom in 1914, he's nowhere to be found because he's just too busy doing other things, mm -hmm. and completely disappears as a political player for almost close to 15 years, but towards the end of the 1920s, he starts developing interest again. And now he wants to be elected president of Congress. And, and he does that in a very contentious manner because Pixley was pretty confident in his own abilities, confident to an extent that should we say, uh, in a sense that would have been interpreted to be arrogant by others. I mean, of course, he gained reputation for that. And, and, and perhaps understandably, I mean, for a young man who had gone to the United States as a 14-year-old, went to Columbia and Oxford, I mean, that he would think he was a pretty big deal. I mean, that's how he felt. And so he was successful in being elected president of Congress in April 1930. Now, and that was the most difficult period of his life. <clears throat> because even though he was a visionary, but he was not actually a good leader, not an inclusive leader. And, and so Congress went through a period of significant decline under his leadership between 1930 and 1937. Partly because he was going through a difficult period in his own personal and professional life because he had been struck off the role of Artenis, I mean, due to some misconduct. And so um, for a man who owned a huge property in Johannesburg, I mean, that had horse tables and his house was the only house, I mean, with horse tables, I mean, because he had taken it from the UK. He was riding horses, I mean, in, in Johannesburg in Sophia town which is quite uh, amusing if you think about it. And so he was completely broke, really broke. And so he decides to live mostly in Swaziland, where the king of, of Swaziland, in a sense, was his patron in supporting him financially. At the same time, he was president of Congress. I mean, so Congress went through a very difficult time. I mean, it nearly collapsed under his leadership. Mm. And so until he was removed uh, in, in 1937 and instated as, as an attorney, practicing attorney uh, in 1942. And so he started rebuilding his life again. But even though he was going through all of these problems, he was still recognized as one of the leading figures uh, in South Africa, so much so that when he dies, he died in 1951. I mean, he was, described as somebody, in a sense, who was the founder of black unity in South Africa, of African nationalism, and probably the most influential South African of the first uh, half of uh, the 20th century, if not the 20th century as a whole. And so that's interesting that at that <clears> time, he was sort of up on this, this pedestal, this, this great, had been this great statesman, but 
Um, but but then obviously his uh, his popularity or the knowledge of him and what his contribution had been sort of started to fade away a little bit. Is that because other great leaders came then sort of came through whose stars shone higher in a way than Pixley's had? Or what, what was the reason why he's sort of not quite as well remembered um, as he probably should yes. be? Yeah, well, I mean, it was, uh, it was partly because the politics also changed. Uh, Pixley represented a particular kind of politics, I mean, in a sense, more moderate, more accommodationist, in a sense. Um, and, and the politics that was introduced by the next generation of leaders like Nelson Mandela was completely different from what Pixley represented. Pixley would not have led a protest march, never have done that. I mean, so he was the man of a suit and a tie who thought, um, political change for black people will come through reasonable debate, appealing uh, to uh, white leaders in South Africa and perhaps even appealing to the well, British Empire first, I mean, when it was there, but in a sense for black people staking their claim as in a sense educated British subjects. I mean, that was Pixley's politics. Mm -hmm. Why generation in a sense adopted different tactics and thought about politics differently and enabled in many ways by the changes in places like Johannesburg because when Pixley came from the United Kingdom South Africa was not or a number of black Africans were not urbanized in a sense they still lived uh, in the rural areas but after the Second World War, I mean, in the 1940s, 1950s, there's huge influx into urban centers. And that's the reason why it is possible to start organizing these people as workers. I mean, the first major strike, the mine workers strike was in 1946. Such a strike would not have been possible in the 1920s, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the new generation of leaders find a constituency that was just not there. Uh, when when Pixley was the leader of, of, of Congress. And of course, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, young people like Nelson Mandela who come uh, into the political scene in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, Pixley by then is in his late 50s, 60s. And so he's an old man. Uh, and then there is apartheid, I mean, which is introduced in 1948, in a sense that shifts the terms of political engagement in South Africa and how South Africans saw themselves and what they thought of political change. While before the idea was that there could be a moderate cause to political liberation in South Africa, that changes with the introduction of apartheid in the 1940s, I mean, in 1948. And so people like Pixley Sagasem and the leaders before him, in a sense, get forgotten. Mm. And of course, he's exiled in the 1960s. And, and people who, the young generation, I mean, people who are born in the 1970s, they really have no idea of the leaders of the ANC like Pixley Sagasem until his star, in a sense, rises again uh, in, the, in the early 21st century. Thank you just so much for, for giving us this, this insight into um, Pixley's life this morning. And um, throughout the, uh, the month of October in the UK, we celebrate Black History Month. Uh, and wow. a part of that is about celebrating lesser known um, uh, people um, yes. who kind of have, 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 um, have had an impact on, on some sort of area of black history or culture or whatever. So um, it's just been really great to hear about him. Um, thank you so much. What I will do at the end of this film is I'll put in a little link to your book. So if people are interested, okay. then thank they you. can go and, yeah. and read much more about him. And we're really looking forward to welcoming you to Jesus College at some point in the future again. Um, I, I look forward to, to Give it. a talk about Pixley to our community. Um, when times are a little bit better. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed this. Yes.